Year 13, Year 1, Further Maths, Lesson 2 on Complex Numbers, Multiplying and Dividing Numbers in Modulus Argument Form. So we're going to start off by thinking about what it actually means when you multiply one complex number by another. So I want you to consider some complex numbers, Z1, um, such that Z1 is equal to R1 cos theta1 plus I sine theta1 and z2, which is equal to r2, cos theta2, plus i sine theta2. So both numbers presented in their modulus argument form. So let's think about what z1 would actually look like on our argon diagram. I'm going to actually draw it on, and let's say it's over here. You can think of it a little bit like a vector, remember. So there's Z1, there's R1, and there is theta1. Now, what we don't always think about is the fact that this is an example of a stretch and a rotational transformation. So I want you to think about the fact that Z1 is equal to Z1 multiplied by the number 1. Now, normally we would really just consider 1 as a real number, but you can think of any number as a complex number, so you could think of 1 as 1 plus 0i. So that number 1, imagine it lies here along the x-axis, the real axis 1, and to create z1 we multiply z1 by 1. So what's happened is we've rotated 1 like that by an angle of theta 1, the argument of z1, but we've then had to stretch it out like that by a scale factor, which is the modulus of z1 to stretch out to the right length. So imagine that this is now your x-axis, this line on which z1 lies. So if we then create the product Z2, Z1, we're taking Z2 and we're multiplying it by Z1. So effectively, we're going to rotate again, this time by an angle theta2, and we're going to multiply by the value of the modulus of Z2. And that takes us to the product Z1, Z2, or Z2, Z1, doesn't really matter. So this has length R1, R2. So think about multiplying one complex number by another as a rotation and a stretch, or rotation and an enlargement. And there is a term for that, which is a spiral dilation. So now, this is very interesting, because can you see that the modulus of Z1, Z2, the complex number which is the product of Z1 and Z2, is equal to R1, R2, which is the product of the individual moduluses of Z1 and Z2. And the argument of this product, Z1, Z2, is this angle here. And can you see it's theta1 plus theta2, which is the argument of Z1 plus the argument of Z2. So we're going to summarise some of the general rules that we have just seen. So if we have complex numbers, Z1 and Z2, and I'm not going to represent them in any particular format for the moment, we can say that the modulus of the product of Z1 and Z2, so mod Z1, Z2, is equal to mod Z1 multiplied by mod Z2. And it works with division as well. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. The modulus of Z1 divided by Z2 is equal to the modulus of Z1 divided by the modulus of Z2. We also know that the argument of the product, Z1 and Z2, is equal to the argument of Z1 
plus the argument of z2. And the argument of z1 over z2 is equal to the argument of z1 take away the argument of z2. And you need to make sure you learn these four rules and you will see just how much simpler they make calculations. Now, we're going to prove these rules in a minute. So make sure you've made a clear note of them, first of all. So we're going to start off by proving that the modulus of Z1, Z2 equals the modulus of Z1 multiplied by the modulus of Z2. You can see that in yellow. And we're going to prove that the argument of Z1, Z2 is equal to the argument of Z1 plus the argument of Z2. So how do I start this off? I want to define both Z1 and Z2 in modulus argument format. So here we go. And we'll give them a symmetrical appearance for simplicity. Let me just correct that. That should be a theta 1 there. So Z1 is equal to R1 cos theta 1 plus I sine theta 1. Z2 is equal to R2 cos theta 2 plus I sine theta 2. So we're now going to consider the product of Z1 and Z2. So we're going to consider Z1 multiplied by Z2. So that will equal R1 cos theta 1 plus I sine theta 1 multiplied by R2 cos theta 2 plus I sine theta 2. Be very careful with your theta 1s and theta 2s. So R1 and R2, they are both scalar values. They will multiply together to give us R1, R2 at the beginning. And we then need to multiply together this pair of double brackets. So term by term, as you would with a pair of linear brackets, we will perform the expansion. So to give this some clarity, I'll show you what I'm doing. So that's cos theta 1 multiplied by cos theta 2. And then I have i cos theta 1 sine theta 2. And then here, plus i sine theta 1 cos theta 2. And always run out of space when doing this sort of thing. We've got one more. Now, i multiplied by i gives us negative 1. So that's negative sine theta 1 sine theta 2. Now, I'm going to collect together my real and imaginary parts. So the real parts here and here. Cos theta 1 cos theta 2 minus sine theta 1 sine theta 2, and the complex parts, so that's here and here, we will take out the factor of i, and then we have cos theta 1 sine theta 2 plus sine theta 1 cos theta 2, and we'll close off that bracket there. So this is r1, r2, and then let's look at what we have inside this set of square brackets. So I want to start off by having a look at this. Do you recognise what this is? You should recognise it for a trigonometric identity. It is, in fact, cos of theta 1 plus theta 2, compound angle formula. And similarly here, do you recognise this? This is another trigonometric identity at work. It is i multiplied by the sine of theta 1 plus theta 2. So we now know that z1, z2 is equal to this result here. So can you see it's in modulus argument form? Which means that we can simply read off the fact that the modulus of z1, z2 is equal to r1, r2, which of course is equal to mod z1 multiplied by mod z2. So that completes the proof of this statement. Now, the argument of z1, z2 
is equal to this angle here, theta 1 plus theta 2, which is equal to the argument of z1 plus the argument of z2. And that completes this proof over here as well. So we're now going to prove these results here for when you divide one complex number by another complex number. So how are we going to do this? So I'm going to start off by letting z1 over z2 equal w, which means that if we can find the modulus and the argument of w and show the results above, we've completed our proof. So how am I going to do this? Well, I'm going to rewrite this as z1 equals w multiplied by z2. So remember, w is just some other complex number. And you learn how to divide one complex number by another earlier on in your study of further pure, looking at realising the denominator. So you know that this process is feasible. So z1 is equal to w multiplied by z2, which means we now have a product of two complex numbers. So we can use the rules that we have just proven. So the modulus of z1 has got to equal the modulus of this product here. But we know that the modulus of the product is the product of the moduluses of the individual complex numbers. So I can then rearrange this to tell me that the modulus of w is equal to the modulus of z1 over the modulus of z2. But what is w actually equal to? It's equal to z1 over z2, which tells me that the modulus of z1 over z2 is equal to the modulus of z1 over the modulus of z2, thus proving this result here. Now, can I also use this system to prove the other result with the arguments? Well, let's take a look at this. So again, I'm going to go back to this statement here. And we know that the argument of z1 must equal the argument of this product, wz2. So the argument of z1, using the rule that we proved for the products, must be the argument of w plus the argument of z2. So we can rearrange this to say that the argument of w is equal to the argument of z1 take away the argument of z2. But what is w equal to? Again, it's z1 over z2. So this tells me that the argument of z1 over z2 is equal to the argument of z1 take away the argument of z2. So we've proven this second result as well. So we're going to have a look at this in action. Here are two complex numbers written in modulus argument form. And what we're going to do is we are going to use the rules that we have just proven to find the products z1, z2. Now, this is the beauty of these rules. We do not have to go back to the beginning, back to basics, and do a double bracket expansion here. Because if we can find the modulus of z1, z2, and find its argument, then we can just piece it together using modulus argument four. So all we have to do is find mod z1, z2, and arg z1, z2, rather than doing a two bracket multiplication of this pair of complex numbers, which would involve quite a lot of algebra. So mod z1, z2 is equal to the modulus of z1 multiplied by the modulus of z2, which is 2 multiplied by 3, which is 6. And hopefully you can see the modulus in each of these here. Now, the argument of z1, z2 is going to equal the argument of z1 plus the argument of z2. So where are the arguments? Can we see those as well? Yes, we can. Here's the argument here, and here's the argument of z2. So the overall argument will equal pi by 3 plus 5 pi by 6, which comes to a value of 7, 6 pi. Now, if you are eagle-eyed, you will have spotted that this is not within the boundaries of the principal argument.
because it's not between minus pi and pi. So what do we do? Well, let's think about it. So where does an angle of 7 sixth pi belong? Well, here's an angle of pi, radian 7 sixth of pi is over here, and this little angle here is pi by 6. So what would an equivalent angle be? Well, it would be this obtuse angle here, which has got to be minus 5 pi by 6. So actually, the argument has got to be minus 5 pi by 6. So this gives us the product z1, z2, which would equal 6 multiplied by cos minus 5 pi by 6 plus i sine minus 5 pi by 6. Now, a little trick that you will want to remember is if you end up with an angle that is not within the principal argument range, simply add or subtract 2 pi or multiples of 2 pi to get you within the range. So 7 sixths pi minus 2 pi will equal minus 5 pi over 6. So sometimes you have to add the multiples of 2 pi, sometimes you have to subtract the multiples of 2 pi, but it just allows you to use this unit circle to get the correct angle. So make sure you remember that rule and we'll have a look at using that in the next example. So let's look at another example. Again, we have a pair of complex numbers defined in modulus argument format. And we're going to find the complex number z1 over z2. And rather than doing a complex division of one complex number by another, which would involve realising the denominator and quite a lot of expansion, a lot of algebra, we're simply going to find the modulus and argument of z1 over z2 and then piece together our overall complex number. So we know this is equal to mod z1 over mod z2 using the rules that we proved. So that is 4 over 8, which is, of course, a half. So we've got the modulus of z1 over z2. Now, what about the argument of z1 over z2? Well, this is the argument of z1. Take away the argument of z2. And hopefully you can see the arguments here. So this is equal to minus pi by 4. Take away 5 pi by 6. Now, what does that come to? Negative 13 pi by 12, which is, of course, negative 1 and 1 twelfth of pi. And remember, your principal argument has got to be between pi and negative pi. So we're out of range. So remember what I said in the previous example, you can add or subtract multiples of 2 pi to get you into the correct range. So if we add uh, 2 pi to this, this then gives us an argument of 11 over 12 pi. So we can say from here that z1, z2 is equal to a half cos of 11 twelfths pi plus i sine 11 twelfths pi. Now, if you're not happy with this process here, you can always just draw yourself a very quick sketch of the argand diagram. Now, what would an angle of negative 1, one and 1 twelfth um, pi look like? Well, negative means you're making a clockwise angle. So that means you would go all the way over to here, which is pi radians, and then a little bit further to go 1 twelfth. So here is your angle here. This is your negative 13 over 12 pi or 1 and 1 twelfth pi. And what is that equivalent to if we go in this direction here? Well, if this part here is simply 1 twelfth pi, well, this purple angle has got to be 11 twelfths pi so that the two add up to pi degrees, pi radians on a straight line. But it is the most efficient way is to add or subtract multiples of 2 pi to ensure your argument is within the principal argument range.